Ready. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today, Warren and I are going to be talking about the Oldsmobile. Um, so, for general history, um, it's two passenger curb dash Olds were the first mass produced car in the world, uh, making Ransom the Olds uh, the father of the American auto industry. Um, these cars were turned out daily in the way here, um, And by 1903, there were more curb dash Olds on American roads than any other vehicle combined. Um, during his production run, um, from 1901 to approximately uh, 1907, um, 19,000 uh, were sold and its cost was about $650. Um, one of the most successful songs ever written about this kind of automobiles uh, is called In My Merry Oldsmobile, uh, and it owed its inspiration to this kind of car. Um, now, one of the most famous events involving the Oldsmobile was the 1903 Oldsmobile Transcontinental Drive. Um, two men named Lester Whitman and Eugene Hammond um, started planning a transcontinental automobile trip from San Francisco to New York. Um, Whitman and Hammond uh, reached out to an automaker, uh, Ransom Olds, to support them in committing to this trip. Um, and Olds agreed to furnish them an automobile runabout um, and pay their travel expenses along, along the way. Um, after getting their Oldsmobile uh, custom built, um, in the summer of 1903, they planned to drive across the U.S. Uh, was in his finishing touches. Uh, and this transcontinental trip turned into a race uh, against H. Nelson Jackson and Tom Fetch, both of whom were either doing their own uh, automobile transcontinental trips at the time. Um, once it became apparent uh, that Winton and Tom Fetch uh, were going to heed Whitman and Hammond's uh, Oldsmobile um, with their significant head start. Uh, they changed their plans. Instead of driving from San Francisco to New York, uh, they decided to drive from San Francisco to Portland, Maine. Uh, that way they could uh, get a long distance record of their speed. With that in mind, uh, Whitman and Hammond set, uh, set off uh, in their Oldsmobile on July 6, 1903. Over the course of the transcontinental trip, they faced uh, numerous mechanical breakdowns, and over the course of the race, they lost 27 days. Uh, on September 18, 1903, they arrived in New York uh, and greeted Mayor Seth, Seth Lowe as originally planned, and then continued heading northeast. And on September 23, 1903, the Oldsmobile finally reached uh, its intended destination at Portland's Post uh, Office Square. And specific history about uh, our Oldsmobile here. Uh, this was originally on loan from Thomas Watson, Jr. Uh, and on December 18, 1984, Watson transformed this Oldsmobile loan into a donation and has remained here ever since. Nice. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular car. Um, it's a 19, it's either a late 01 or a very early 02 by the serial number. They weren't that, um, oh, they weren't that crazy about numbers back then that early. Uh, so it's hard to tell. This car has got the characteristics of an 01 and also some of the characteristics of an 02. Uh, they're, a, they're a single cylinder car, water cooled, four stroke, tiller steered, planetary transmission. Um, you can ask me at some time what each individual thing means in, in that. Uh, but this car's been here a long time. It was one of my favorites when I first showed up. I like the early cars. They don't get much earlier than this. Uh, over 19,000 curved dash olds were built. Um, everybody thinks that the Model T was the first mass-produced car. I say no, but it was the first super mass-produced car where Ford made millions and Ransom Olds made thousands of these. Uh, uh, Ransom Eli Olds um, came from Lansing, Michigan, where his family had uh, a business building engines. They, they built small engines, make and break engines and that. Olds Motor Works was the name of the company. And um, Ransom wanted to build cars and his family didn't have any interest. So he went off on his own and started uh, engineering and building cars in Lansing, Michigan. But the car industry was quickly moving to Detroit. And so he moved the whole company uh, to Detroit, brand new buildings, 
uh, getting ready to build this and other cars. Prototypes existed of the curved dash holes and the other cars when he moved to Detroit. Almost right away, the factory caught on fire, burned to the ground, burned all of the prototypes up except for one curved dash holes. So he moved back to Lansing, Michigan, and Lansing said that um, the fire that Olds had in Detroit was the best thing that ever happened to Lansing, Michigan. So they went back to Lansing and started producing thousands of curved dash holes. And they quite possibly would be the first car you would see in a town. They were affordable, it was very early, um, they were reliable for their time. And uh, even though we hear about cross country runs with a lot of breakdowns, any car would have had a lot of breakdowns. Uh, dependable uh, at that time was a relative term. Uh, we've run this car a lot. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this in the shop is you get a chance to see A, what, what we do in here, and, uh, and B, what a uh, curved dash Oldsmobile looks like when you turn it inside out. So uh, what's happening here is the power in this car started to diminish quite a few years ago. Every year we would run it and it would get a little weaker and a little weaker and a little weaker. And, um, and we finally determined that we thought it needed a valve job. So uh, I would say that we're probably 80 to 90 percent correct, but we have not run it yet. It's still going back together. And what you can see in the car is this huge flywheel. And cars of this era, this, this is what kept them running. It's kind of like the auto engine in the energy room. Big, big, big flywheel carries the engine through the four strokes. And it also makes the car feel powerful when you take off. All the kinetic energy is stored up in the flywheel. All the engine has to do is keep the flywheel spinning. Uh, so uh, unless you're going up a really long hill. And uh, these three tank looking pieces on the back. Uh, this is the gas tank, the square one. Uh, this is the water tank, the copper one. And this is actually the muffler. And then you can see uh, the cylinder head partially apart. The two valves down there look new because they are new. And if nobody knows what a valve looks like on that table behind you there, you, you guys know what valves look like. You can pass that around. That's one of the valves that came out of it. It looks pretty modern. Right. Actually. Right. Yeah. These cars had uh, two forward speeds and one reverse. Uh, there's three pedals on the floor. This is the brake, that big pedal. Right next to it, this little pedal is the throttle. And you have a pedal back here, which is the uh, compression release. And then to make it go, you have two neutrals and a reverse. All the way back is reverse, and it doesn't stay there. It comes back, and then the next notch is low, and then you get another notch, which is neutral, and then a forward notch, which is high, and it will stay in high. You heard it click and stay there. The uh, crank is on the side. Looks like a Victrola wind-up crank. Um, I've yet to be able to start this car from the driver's seat, but, uh, and, uh, but I have had my, uh, my pants nearly uh, ripped off by the crank spinning backwards if the engine f fires backwards. It'll grab your belt and, uh, and you know you've had it. Oiling is very simple. It's just got a little oil cap and you do the rest of a little oil cup just like uh, the auto engine does. That's dripping oil down into the crankcase. If you get too much oil down there, it smokes and you drain it off. And uh, if you don't have enough, the engine will seize and that's not good. So it's got a battery and a, a signal coil. The radiator is under the floors there. And uh, um, it's a chain drive. And the brakes um, are, in the, are in the transmission. Uh, this is a Model R. Don't ask me why he started with R on his first car dash holes, but it is. It's an R. And I forget, at 1400, they moved on to a 6C, and it advanced through several model numbers, and by 1908, it was, it was done. So I, I'd also like the horn on this one, too. <laughs> yeah, that's so that the cows and birds know you're coming. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cool car. It moves right along, 20, 25 miles an hour. Uh, they, were, uh, they were easy to drive, you know, with their, with their tiller steering. 
Another interesting uh, part about this car is the springs go from the back axle all the way to the front. And uh, I forget who it was, somebody was here when we were talking about uh, the suspension on cars. This one's an unusual one. And because the axle's moving up and down, there's also a set of springs uh, between the steering mechanism and, and the uh, tiller. Uh, the headlights are kerosene, as is the taillight. They throw zero light, it's so people can see you coming. Um, and um, they're just a cute little car. I like this car in the collection so much. At one point, I was I was bored in the winter. I I built a model of this car. So it's kind of like uh, putting together a jigsaw puzzle. I'll just pick a car in the collection and build it as a model. Uh, the wheels are um, artillery, they're called the artillery style wheels where the spokes go right into the hubs. They are all, they're all wood except for the rim and they're called, and the rims are called clincher rims and the tires are clincher tires, that means the cross section of the rim looks like this and the tire fits right down in and these clinch it onto the rim. And uh, on this car, I like the non-skid tires. If you look close at the tread on the tires, it says non-skid, non-skid, non-skid all the way around the tire. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember, uh, I remember uh, back when basically this car got here, uh, you know, fresh. Uh, I did not remember that uh, Tom Watson had signed it over uh, to, to the museum. Uh, that makes perfect sense. He signed over a lot of cars. Oh, I don't know one thing I didn't mention. Uh, there's two little handles uh, here. One is the choke, and the other one is spark advance. That's it, you know, important things to remember when you're starting it, which is probably what I had forgotten when it, when it bit me. Uh, so that's one of the things just to be, you know, to be careful with on these early cars. Do I have any questions? One Yes. What's a choke? What's a choke? Yes. Well, uh, we don't, uh, modern cars don't choke anymore in, in the traditional sense. They have fuel injectors that know it's cold. The engine is going to need more fuel. So the computer says, more fuel, and the fuel injector delivers it. But before that, carburetors were not controlled by computers. And, the, and air goes through the air filter, through the carburetor, and to the engine. Well, if it's a cold start, you need more fuel. So the air is going through there, and the fuel is admitted in the carburetor. So you have this plate inside the carburetor, and it closes. And that creates more of a suction on the carburetor side. It's just shutting off the air that's going through it. That means more gas will go in it. It's all metered amounts. So yeah, that's what a choke does. It, it enriches the fuel-air mixture going into the engine for a cold start. Okay. Yeah. Various ways uh, they, uh, they would control that on cars through the 50s and 60s, but back in these days, you control everything yourself. They haven't invented gizmos to control it for you yet. So any car that you're going to drive prior to like 1950 is going to have a choke lever and, and some even beyond that. By the 70s, mechanical gizmos were doing it for you. Okay. Yeah. Some of us will remember you have to hit the gas pedal to set the choke. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. And then yeah. If, you, if you leave the choke on too long, it'll slug the car. Right. Uh, you have too much fuel. Yeah. Sit and wait until it evaporates. Yeah. You have to wait. Yeah. The good old days. Yeah. 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 And they were not very efficient. Chokes are not very efficient. Why? Because they rely on us. Okay, we're not very efficient. Take a look around. So, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, Ransom Eli Olds, uh, 1908, he was done, and uh, he sold out his own company basically to himself and, uh, and formed uh, Rio, Ransom Eli Olds. So the Rio is a Ransom Eli Olds. Uh, derivative. And we have both Rios and Oldsmobiles in the collection. Uh, up, up through the decades, we have a, uh, some pretty good cars out there. Yeah. Yeah.